afternoon, folks. Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, I got to warn you, if you do ever speak at a conference and they put you in after lunch, um, you tend to see a couple folks nodding off. So <laughs> I'm calling you as the stand-up comic. I think it's a lot worse treatment. This is a uh, odd presentation. Um, I go around to about 50 conferences a year talking to developers. And in the past decade or so, uh, a lot of my fellow gray hairs and I have noticed that a lot of developers don't have any training in relational theory, database concepts, structured query language, set theory. And the programmers all come up to us and say, but my query stinks. Why is that? Why is the database doing this work? So this is a talk I've been developing over the last couple of years for developers to teach them what happens when they write queries. Um, I have a four hour longer version of this that goes into a lot of detail on how to do this. This is kind of an overview to give you the insight of what's going on behind the scenes. By the way, if I talk too rapidly or my accent throws you off or you have a question, uh, please shout it out. The only dumb question is the one you don't ask and take home and let it fester inside you for a while. Uh, this is the little details on the session that you probably saw on the sign-up sheet. Uh, I am Dave Stokes. I'm a MySQL Community Manager. Uh, a long time ago, I was a certification manager for MySQL AD. So if you know anyone with a MySQL certification, uh, they're, they might have my signature on the bottom of the piece of paper they have. Uh, as a community manager, I travel the world talking about MySQL and databases. I'm also your lightning rod back to Oracle Management. So if you ever have a question, concern, or gripe, give it to me, and I'll get it to Oracle Management. Um, fairly easy to find. Twitter handle is at Stoker. I mainly tweet about very odd subjects and databases, which might get a little bit of overlap there from the Venn diagram. Uh, these slides are up at slideshare.net slash David M. Stokes. I have a other bunch of presentations up there. So for those of you who haven't paying attention to MySQL, we're now 21 years old. We're no longer the bright, shiny startup we were when we were bought for a billion dollars. Sun bought us for a million dollars in 2008. Oracle bought us um, and a whole bunch of other stuff uh, a year later. And no one's bought us for a while, so we're feeling unloved. So if you haven't seen a billion dollars, you may want to go back to the beginning. Last week, we announced the next version of MySQL, MySQL 8. I have a lot of neat features. We'll have a true data dictionary. Uh, you database nerds are jumping up and down right now going, yay, I'm not doing that, so I'll do it next week. We're going to have roles, going to have table, common table expressions, and a whole bunch of other neat features. Uh, look for this in about a year. It's a big change for us, and it's going to make MySQL uh, a lot faster and a lot bigger. You'll be able to have a million tables in a database, no problem. You'll be able to do transactional DDM. Also, we announced last week at Oracle Open World group replication. That's active master master replication built on top of what you do now. Unlike Alara, it's not at a layer above the database, it's up to the database level using the current MySQL replication technology. Uh, it's got a few points we're trying to smooth over right now, but it's really exciting. You can have eight masters write to one, all the others get updated. Uh, one of them goes down, everything fails over automatically without you having to intervene. A year ago, we introduced the JSON data type to MySQL. This lets you store an entire valid JSON document in a column of a table in a MySQL instance. A lot of stuff was just coming out last year from APIs and other areas that want to output stuff in JSON. So if you need to be able to store JSON like you would a real or an int or a timestamp, you can now have a JSON data type. Also, we have a document store. Uh, for those of you who didn't get this presentation yesterday, this is my moment. Um, what if you don't know SQL? What if you just want to do CRUD? You just want to create, replace, update, delete. You don't really do all that SQL stuff. We can now uh, promise you that using the new protocol that we have. And also, we have at threat encryption using Oracle Key Vault to manage your keys. Uh, encrypting data isn't the hard part. It's decrypting it and getting it the way you want it, when you want it. And in that case, the hard part is the management. But enough about that. This is what happens. The story, this is kind of a story about what happens when you write a query that goes off to a database. I assume that you all are probably using MySQL or something similar. Um, if you see something here that pops up you haven't seen before, please shout it out. 
So the idea is you shoot on query and you send it off to the server. What happens there? Well, you're writing a structured query language. Uh, it's been around since the 70s. The original idea between S ideas for SQL was to manage data storage efficiently. Uh, I don't see any gray hairs in here, probably my age or older. Uh, used to be you had to allocate everything because disk space was highly expensive and high, very slow. So uh, Todd and Dave and a few other folks figured out the best way to park up the data to make it as efficient as possible store it. Store things in relation. Uh, if you have customer information, put that one table. If you have product information, put that in another table. The idea was to break things up efficiently. So one of the goals was minimal duplication. Uh, back when disk drives were the size of washing machines or small cars um, and very expensive, you didn't want to have the same thing around twice. Now SQL has been around, like I said, for decades and it's based on set theory and relational calculus. I said the word calculus, someone bought the book before the door, that's good. Um, the big trouble here is you have to normalize data. In the past 50 years, we've been pushing object-oriented programming, not top-down design. Um, part of the thing with top-down design is you architect your data. You normalize it, you split it up into component pieces. You'll have a street address, a city, a country, and a postal code. Uh, break it up that way. We don't teach that anymore. So, roughly 2% of you have had any formal training in structured query languages or set theory, and you're still using databases. It's kind of an implementation mismatch there. So here's a very simple query. For this talk, I'm using the MySQL World Database. It's what we've been using for 20 some odd years in all our documentation and all our training classes. And it's World Book Encyclopedia Data on Cities and Countries. Uh, it's very dated now, but we've been using it for so long, it's kind of folksy and uh, works well for us. So we're going to write a simple query. We're going to go out and get the city of the city, the name of the country, we're going to get the name of the city from a table called city, we're going to get the name of the country from a table called name of the country, and we're going to match up the cities so we make sure that we get the right city with the right country. Someone previously architected this so that the country.code values would match the city.country code values. If you want to see this, uh, the hard way I can show you later. But take my word for it, that's the way you match up these two tables. By the way, if you skip the country code and skip the city code, you get every city listed in every country. It's kind of a cartoon you're drawing with this real method. I've seen a lot of developers do that. I've done it. So, as I said, someone previously split up everything so that we know that country code matches the city.country code. And that's our matrix. This, ironically, is the way I think a lot of you should think of your databases. This is probably Loki server somewhere. So, here's some PHP code. By the way, I go back to PHP on a personal homepage. I was a uh, webmaster for the American Heart Association, and I was looking for a templating engine. And Rasmus Ludorf put it out there, and it did exactly what I wanted. I then started working in a database called MSQL, which I was part of. And then soon after that, I uh, started working in MySQL, and that was kind of my for the MySQL era. So we have a simple query. We need to map that to MySQL iQuery, or it can also go to a PDO query. By the way, if you're using the old MySQL underscore um, call in your code anywhere, uh, that's been deprecated. Please don't do that. Uh, there's some security issues in there that you uh, don't want to know about. By the way, MySQL pays for the development of all this stuff. We have two developers working full-time on it. Um, PDO doesn't have anyone dedicated to that. And everyone else moved off the old MySQL underscore a long time ago. So, you send off your query. The first question that 
we need to know and we need to practice and we talk to the server. MySQL authentication is a little promiscuous. Uh, for those of you working in deep security, you'll find it rather appalling, but it's the way it's been for 20 years and So your application becomes something over the network or a socket for the server. Uh, MySQL will take a look at it and says, the first thing it's going to ask, is the system you're talking from to the server allowed to talk to the server? If you're not on the whitelist or the things aren't wild carded, those are going to be missing and it'll ask you to submit it. Does that scale that? Second, are you using a valid account? And password or authentication string. Um, also, some accounts have limits: the number of queries you can do per hour, the number of volumes you can do per hour. Um, so it's going to check to make sure that you're you're okay there. And then number three is: Do you have permission to access the data you seek? Can you get to the tables, a column, or even the database that you want? So let's say that. Your host is okay, your login's okay, and your permissions are good to go. Duplicate there. Next, the server does the hard work. Did you send something that was syntactically correct? Does it have a, a the right format? So that's checking the basics. Then the optimizer starts looking at your query. What is the person asking for? What columns do they need, what databases do they need. Uh, here it's going to also recheck some permissions to make sure that uh, you have the right access. And it's going to lay out the recipe of, of what you want. You can solve this with all the ingredients. Then it builds something called a query plan. Any Oracle DBAs or Oracle shop people in here? One, wow. Um, Oracle query plans are a little different than, or than uh, what MySQL does. But the basic idea is the optimizer is going to look for the best way, the cheapest way, the easiest way to get the data. Now, Oracle pioneered it, and just about every other database has followed with the cost model. The cost model is based on the most expensive thing in the chain, which used to be reading something off a disk. Reading something off a disk is a hundred thousand times slower than reading it out of memory which means if this gentleman here started doing backflips for 100,000, we could come back in two and a half weeks and check the last couple hours. So if we could do one a second, it would take two and a half weeks. Uh, right now, this is changing. Hardware devices are getting a lot faster. Uh, a lot of memory storage devices are blindingly fast. And all the database vendors are trying to figure out how do we take advantage of that. So if you have something that's both out in spinning disk, on the solid state disk, and out in our memory storage, um, which is the easiest and fastest way to get it off all those. Uh, if we have to mix things back and forth, uh, how do we arrange it so that we send off the slowest query to the hardware first? But for right now, just know that the optimizer is looking for the cheapest way to get the data. Now, if you're interested in this, in later versions of MySQL 5.7 and 8, uh, you can actually look into the MySQL system tables and see the server underscore cost and the engine cost tables for details. So where is cost determined? Well, the optimizer keeps statistics on previous fetches for data. Um, that sh should be a warning to some of you that if you just reboot a, a MySQL database or any other database and it hasn't been running for a a time you're trying to do a benchmark, your benchmark's going to be thrown off because the optimizer doesn't have enough statistics to know how to deep dive for the data. Uh, if you're benchmarking, uh, what I recommend is you set up um, like 100,000, 200,000 known queries of, of good data that you have, run that through uh, an hour or half an hour before you're benchmarking, make sure the optimizer and everything's warmed up. Now. The statistics are based on what it had to do on similar queries in the past to get your data. Uh, by the way, with MySQL, you can save, save these statistics between boots, but that's beyond here. But if you, um, you got to remember that it's based on a guesstimate of what it will do to get your current data. 
Uh, for those of you who are really interested, this is an optimizer trait. This is where the optimizer goes through and starts evaluating the various options. Uh, this is our query from earlier. It knows it has two databases or two tables within the same database it has to go out, and it has some statistics. I know this is hard to read, but it has some uh, costs that it knows what it's going to take to go out and get this information. Uh, for example, this is a, a blow-up of it. Uh, MySQL mainly does nested loop joins. Uh, we do have an index we can use to go out and get this data. I'll talk a little bit more there. And it has some statistics that it's going to come back. And in this case, it's going to tell us to do part of the query. It's going to have to read 239 rows. And that's 100% uh, of that table. Now, every time you add a column to a query, that has another factorial complexity the optimizer has to add in. Now, there are some shortcuts you can do uh, mathematically if they're from the same database, but if it's another table, you're increasing everything by, a fact, by uh, another factorial. So for those of you who go out and just grab everything you think you might possibly need rather than exactly what you do need, you are costing yourself speed and time. Now, some databases allow you, once you have figure out what the query plan should be, to lock it down. So as long as your data never changes and everything is great, it knows exactly the roadmap to get there. Um, it's kind of like burning a path into your GPS, so every time it's going to use the same path over and over again. MySQL doesn't do this. It wants to re-optimize it every time. Uh, how many of you have run explain on query before? Anyone? Wow, great. Um, for those of you who haven't, what you do is you prepend the word explain in front of a query. Uh, from MySQL 5.6 on, you can do it to just about any query. Before that, you had to do it to a select query, which means if you're doing a delete, you can just change the word delete to select and put it explain in front of it. And it comes out and tells you what's going on. Uh, in this case, we're going to be looking at the country and city tables. We have a, a key, a primary key that we can use on that country table. And we know the country code matches that, that key. We're going to have to read 239 rows out of this table. And an estimate of 17 lines out of this table to get every query that we want. Um, if you run MySQL Workbench, which is our second most popular download, uh, it will actually draw this for you in a nice pictorial format, which I think is a little bit easier to read. Uh, once again, we have uh, the country table. Um, if you see something in red, you can right mouse over this and it will give you inf information on how to make that uh, better. Full table scans are usually considered bad. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And here we're going to do a key lookup for every city that we don't want to read. And the nested loop join. I think this is a little bit easier to read than, than that. Uh, but I'm a dinosaur and I grew up with the first one. Now, on MySQL since 5.6, if you have a, a query that's hanging or running slow or you just want to find out what's going on there, uh, you can actually use explain on another process. You have to get onto the server, look at the process list, find that one, and then you can do explain for connection N, because you'll get the connection number, to see the explain on that. Uh, that's been very helpful for a lot of us who go into customer sites and we find, oh, this query is running slow. Well, what is it? Well, we look at it and find out it's not using indexes or it's um, doing things in kind of an odd way or the optimizer is ignoring the indexes. Indexes, for those of you who haven't run into before, lets you go right to the record or records you, you seek. Uh, the, quir the example I used to give all the time, and I'll repeat it here, is imagine you're looking for the plural of a word in a dictionary. Unfortunately, your dictionary was not put together very well. All the pages were thrown in randomly, and there are duplicates that you're not quite sure where they are, but they're not going to be next to the one you're searching for. So if you're looking for the plural of a word like moose, you have to start at the first page, first line, and read to the last line of the last page. That's called a full table scan in database terms, uh, usually very slow. Now. Sometimes you want to do that because you're going through all the customers and doing the quarterly billing, so you have to do a full table scan of that table. Uh, most indexes, you're trying to do a quick in and out to get all that information. By the way, a big hint for a lot of you, compound indexes. When I call my doctor, they want to know my last name, date of birth, and the street I live on. 
So they have a three-part query to look me up. Um, the example I have here is you have a multiple column index for year, month, date. With that, you can search for year, month, date, year, month, and year. Uh, doesn't work for date, but you can use that index. Now the optimizer tries to use indexes as, pos as much as possible. Speeds things up. Less try. Okay, so the optimizer has done the query pan. It's gone out, got your data, and it's going to send it back to your application. That is this very simple 20-minute um, talk on how your query gets out back to the server, goes to the server, and gets back to you with the answer. And there's a copy of the information that you get back from our query. And that's the way how a query is supposed to be run. Now, let's talk a little bit about common problems. N plus one problem. Um, this is usually bad programming practice. Uh, sometimes your ORM forces this on you. Uh, turn on prefetching on your ORM if you can. And the way you avoid this is by thinking in sets. I'll let the database do the heavy lifting. And trouble with n plus 1 is I see a lot of them that are very complicated that you don't realize is an n plus 1 problem to you dig into three or four queries deep and realize they could have done one big query instead of a bunch of little fussy queries. Because every time you make a query, are they allowed to log in? Do they have access? Da 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 da. Return the data. As you're chaining queries, um, it slows things down. Let's say, like, you, you're you need a ride to work tomorrow, so you're going to go to your employee database and you're going to look up to the employees who live near you, and then from those employees who live near you, find the ones who have a parking permit, which would indicate they have a car or some sort of vehicle, and then get their information, give them a phone call so they can give you a ride. Um, a lot of applications code that way, if then, if then, if then, where databases like uh, quick dives in your database can get out, and each database access has cost. So this is a case where you probably write, a, write, instead of three or four queries, do it in one big query. You know, find the folks who live near, near me and have a parking per arm permit and have a phone number. Okay, quick quiz for y'all. Which of these two is better? Your boss comes to you and says, I want to give everyone in sales a 20% raise. So would you rather do that in PHP code on the left or a transaction on the right. By the way, transaction, start transaction commit. Now, the great thing about the one on the right is all the records for folks who match that criteria get done at one time. It's atomic. It's boom, done. Uh, the trouble with the one on the left is halfway through you're running at that. Your boss comes in and says, oh, did I say 20%? I meant 2%. And then you got to figure out, okay, which records have been updated, which ones haven't. I got to go back, put the old ones back, or do I just do the ones I haven't do, done, and then go back and flip the other ones? Uh, gets real messy to do the one on the left. One on the right shows the power of transactions. If you're making adjustments to a whole bunch of records and you want to make sure they're all done at the same time or they're not done at all, this is the way you do it. Okay, another quiz. Which one of those two queries is going to run faster? On the one on the right, the only has a difference where it's going to ask for the first five to come back. First five records. You only want the, the first five city names. Now, um, normally you see this where you have a whole bunch of order buys and sorts and a whole bunch of other stuff uh, on the right-hand side but you only want five records. Now, this is a trick question. As far as the optimizer knows, to do this and this, it's the same amount of work. Yes, sir. Um, that is a good... Having the results stored in a temporary table to do the top five does happen with a lot of databases, and that is a, a good answer. Yes, sir. So, um, uh, one of the trick questions is the uh, same query in both both instances, so running in both instances is, is the first five. Uh, I, 
the right answer is the optimizer will run both queries the same way, and then on the right-hand side, throw away the other um, ones in there after the first five. So, um, bravo on the answer. So the same amount of work is going to have to be done by the optimizer in either case. So if you're sitting there looking at query and running, gee, why is this taking so slow? I only want five people. The last time I looked, there's a thousand records in the table. That, that was ran quickly. You look in there again, and suddenly you have a million records in the table. Um, if you're using limits and wondering why things run slow, that's why. It has to do all the work, um, especially if you're doing complex sorting and all that, because it doesn't know which ones are the top five until the very end. Uh, here's another one. Which runs faster? Uh, we're getting, once again, city names. And we're calling it, we're aliasing the city names as city, and we're aliasing the country name as country. Uh, they're both from the same tables. But here we're ordering by population, and here we're, we're grouping by country name. Which one do you think is going to run faster? proper answer is you honestly don't know. You have to see how your data is architected. Uh, in this case, on the left, the population field is not indexed, which means it's going to uh, um, do all this other work and then go through there and read through all the population records and then sort them, put them in a temporary table and output it. Now, in this case, country.name, that's also not indexed. But, um, ironically, in this set of data that you're playing with here, they just happen to be stored in alphabetical order. So you get a fractional better optimization. But the trouble is, as a programmer, unless you know what the data looks like underneath, you can honestly say there's no way to tell. Uh, by the way, um, how many of you have been programming for less than a year? Okay, so we have interesting people. You know when you open up someone's code, uh, you pull in something with Composer and you're looking at it, and you look at it and there's something wrong with it, you, you get an intuitive gut feel that there's something wrong with the code, it just doesn't look right. Um, not so much since Composer came through, but you pull down people's libraries, you look at them and you go, mm, no, there's something wrong here. You get a gut feeling about it, and you can tell if it's crap code or not almost instantaneously. Database queries, you can't do that can't tell if they're good or bad by looking. You have to look at the data, you have to run explain on it, and you have to see how it works. There's no intuitive way to tell us whether it's a good query or a bad query. Yeah, I, I've seen some horrendous queries. I've also seen horrendous queries that actually work, which always scare me because it takes a while to figure out what they're doing. Uh, by the way, um, about two years ago, a gentleman came up to me and said, I have a wonderful new library for PHP. It does all statistical functions. And I said, great. Uh, I have a stats background. What do you have in there? Well, I have min, max, average, and standard deviation. Okay. Um, so in your little application that's running away on a container, um, you pull down 2 million records and start trying to do an average. What does it do? Well, he was computing very basically adding up all those numbers and then dividing by the number of rows. Uh, and then I showed him that databases usually have all the standard statistical functions. And plus, they're usually running on bigger boxes. Uh, they also are better at crunching numbers. So if you're doing statistic statistical analysis, um, at least anything up to probably finite element analysis, do the crunching on the database. Okay, you've gone through the presentation. Uh, you're at, it's after lunch, that, that food is settling, and you're going, well, that's great, um, but I really don't care about doing all that. I really don't want to do SQL. I don't want to explain queries. I just want to be able to throw my stuff in a database. Well, MySQL and a lot of other uh, relational databases, uh, Postgres, MySQL, or um, Postgres, and SQL Server, now have JSON data types, which means you can put unformatted something is a, a valid JSON document, into a column. It's great for that sort of stuff. And if you're not really going to have a schema 
data, it's a great way to store stuff. Well, it works great, but it's kind of like your teenager throwing everything in the middle of their bedroom saying, but dad, I know where everything is. Why do I have to put things away? I can get to it instantly. Uh, it doesn't scale, it's messy, and it pisses off mom. So also there's no rigor applied to your data. So programmer A is putting in first name, last name, email, and postal address. Uh, second um, programmer is putting in first name, height, uh, weight, and astrological sign. There's no rigor to the data. There's no way to make sure that you're getting all the information you need for your records. Also, we uh, announced fairly recently with MySQL 5.7.13 a new protocol. Uh, this lets you use MySQL as a doc store. So if you just want to connect to the database and do CRUD and drop off your records and do whatever you want with them, you don't need knowledge of MySQL. Currently, we support uh, JavaScript, Node.js, Python, Java. Uh, PHP is coming. Uh, I was bugging folks last week, and all of them were going to tell me it's, it's coming. Uh, it works very well, but once you get past, say, like 100,000, 200,000 million records, uh, you're probably going to bring someone in to do some DBA work, and they're going to architect the data, and they're going to start drawing stuff out of the JSON columns, JSON data, and turn it into your own materialized columns in the database. So you're going to use traditional database techniques on there for speed. Uh, some last-minute hints. Um, first step in great performance is data normalization. There's some wonderful courses and books out there on data normalization. Uh, do yourself a favor, buy one off Amazon, Keep it in your bathroom. Uh, when you have a couple spare minutes, start reading through. Um, it's kind of a osmosis and reverse osmosis process, but it's a great way to learn how to normalize your data. It pays off. Uh, it's a very high-end relational calculus. It's very scary, and uh, you don't need to go that far, but there are mathematical reasons of why you want to normalize your data. Indexes. Indexes are great for speedy searches but they take overhead. So every insert, insert the record, change the index. Delete a record, change the index. Um, also, it tends to be that a lot of folks add more indexes than they may need to. There are tools out there from Kona Toolkit or uh, MySQL SysSchema that will actually go out there and show you indexes that are redundant, indexes that aren't being used. By the way, indexes that aren't being used run after the database has been running for a week. If you do it right after a reboot, no one's, none of the indexes are being used, and you're going to delete uh, too many. Uh, heavy lifting. Uh, like, a, like I mentioned earlier, let the database do the heavy stuff, do transactions, all the SAP functions, be, move big chunks of data. Um, think of your applications like little remoras. The database is the shark. You're just chewing off little bits of stuff that the database is dropping off to you. Disk drives. Do not go cheap on disk drives. Um, in the States, it was fairly common about three years ago to people to go down to their local fries or Best Buys because they're selling terabyte disk drives for 50 bucks. Great. Well, they were consumer-grade disk drives that weren't designed to run 724, 365. So I had a whole bunch of friends who, after six months, started noticing their new terabyte drives were cratering. Um, also, solid-state disks pay for themselves rather quickly. Uh, slow query log. Uh, for those of you who are really interested in what's going on with your server, turn on the slow query log and peruse it every morning with your coffee. Now, some queries are in the slow query log because they are doing a lot of work and it takes more than a second to run it. Uh, you can configure that time, by the way. But start looking for the queries that take a while to run. And if you can save 50% of that time, uh, you can run more than that time, which takes less load off the box. Uh, the slow queries are usually the easiest way to gain performance on a box. SysSchema. Uh, SysSchema has now come into the default with MySQL 5.7. Uh, it was an option in 5.6. This is a bunch of views and stored routines that lets you peer into the heart of your server. Uh, in the past, MySQL was criticized because we really couldn't give you a granular view of what's going on at the low level. SysSchema was written by our support engineers to answer questions. Who's hogging my I.O.? which indexes aren't being used, who's using temp space. Um, they're fairly easy to use and they're well documented. And if you go in through MySQL Workbench, 
uh, you can turn this on and start seeing what's going on with your server. It gives you great views of the low-level stuff if you need to dig down. Um, by the way, I'm sure you've seen this in every slide deck. Uh, contribution sprint. Let me make that. Um, so, in 35 minutes, that was a brief overview of what happens to your query. Um, if you need uh, the slides, they're at slideshare.net slash David and Stokes. It's the most recent slide deck. Um, Twitter handle and email. And if you have any questions or any comments, we've got roughly 20 minutes to more in the room. And if you need me, I'll be around the corner. What advantages does the JSON, I have to repeat everything because they're recording this at the later play, but I'm sure this one guy listening to it is going to go, woo, he repeated the question. Um, in the past, you could take JSON information and throw it into a bar car or a car and had all this wonderful JSON information in there. The only trouble with that is if you want to search it, you use, end up using regular expression. Anyone here write in a regular expression and was able to read it a month later and knew exactly what it was going to do? Uh, that's a superpower I don't think anyone has. I'm waiting for Marvel to come out with that regex man. And, um, um, you can do that, but it's messy and it's not sexy. The new JSON data type, we have 22 functions to let you insert, change, extract, get meta information, uh, do things like search for how many instances of email tags there are in the data, and let you walk that tree. Um, it's... Um, there's a little overhead because we have to put in some pointers into the into the column to get to the various tags. But if you're really concerned about space, you can keep it in text. But for more ease of functionality, the JSON data type is a wonderful thing. Uh, in the past year and a half, I've had roughly 20 folks who've taken big data sets off Mongo and other um, key value pairs and thrown in there, and I haven't heard any complaints. Um, I can show you the easy way uh, with MySQL Workbench. Um, what you do is you get into the, the query writer, and there's a button in there that will let you uh, see the execution plan. And from that, you can actually change the tabular view. It, it takes a lot less to do it than actually describe it. From in there, you can actually get the explain in the tabular form or the optimizer talk. Just when we get done, you come up here and I'll show you. It's real simple. You had a question? Um, you have, you, have you ever used Drupal? Have I ever used Drupal? Yes. I Several years ago, I was maintaining a Drupal 5 site that someone else had written very badly. Okay. This is a very useful idea. Go ahead. Well, it doesn't have a direct tie with Drupal that Acquia would love me to, to bless. Um, the, the thing is, a lot of you are working on code that's just not Drupal. Uh, a lot of you also have other things you're trying to integrate or scrape out of the database that you need to get to it. So... So it, it's, it's like for most, pe most people don't have to know how to change a tire on their car because these days tires last 100,000 kilometers without blowouts. My dad's day, if you got 15,000 miles on a set of tires in the States, you were lucky and you were changing them all the time. So. Well, the idea that I just heard from Colossus. Well, put it this way. Next year when you're on Mastermind, what does an optimizer do in a database? And you'll be able to. Do <laughs> you have any trace for your uh, the, the optimizer trace is probably the best one. Uh, you can debug through it uh, not easily. Uh, there are ways to use GDB and other debuggers on MySQL. It's kind of tricky but well documented. 
We also have, if you're a paying customer with support, a query tool that will actually go out and break things down to the lowest amount. So if you have to be a supported customer, you can use that. Yes, sir. The other thing that pops up from time to time, we don't do it too often, is we'll suddenly have a new reserved word. Uh, with MySQL 8, role becomes a reserved word. How many of you in your table somewhere have the word role buried as a column name? So, um, anyone? Uh, yes, sir. Ironically, um, in the old days, the Postgres folks would tease me that we didn't do subqueries very well, and I'd tease them they didn't do joins very well. Uh, luckily, both databases have made ma major strides in that. With MySQL 5.6 and 5.7, subqueries are a lot better. Um, subqueries, for those who don't know, is um, like a subroutine that spits out stuff. Unfortunately, off in the past, the optimizer wasn't quite clever enough to realize what was being spit out and how to optimize that as long as a bigger query. So um, it's gotten a lot better in the past two releases. So. Yeah, yeah we're going to have com common table expressions with eight, which should make that a little bit easier. Um, but I've also found that by writing jo everything as a join, it's easier for the next person to come behind me and figure out what's going on. Yeah. Um, I had a problem with SQL Lite a couple years ago with CTEs and subqueries all mixed together, and I, I um, had a major migraine trying to figure out what's going on. Another question in here? Yes, sir. The query cache will save the results of a query and a hash of that query. So if the same query is being run over and over again, it knows just to throw that out there. We started turning that off in MySQL 5.6, and it's off in 5.7 by default because it's single-threaded. Um, if you have the same query running over and over again, it's either better to put it in something like a caching layer, memcached, Redis, or something like that, or in your application. Uh, with something like the score of a football game that's, you know, after the game's over, it's not going to change. Um, know, store it someplace where you can get to it easily. You don't want to keep querying the database, but because every time you hit that database, there's a, you know, it's a big performance hit. Um, the other thing is, if you are using the query cache um, on a, a more recent version of MySQL, 
uh, makes more sense to turn it off and turn that memory over to the InnoDB buffer pool and you get much better performance and it is multi-threaded. So it goes off that way. Are triggers good or bad uh, way of optimized data? Um, in the MySQL world, there's not a lot of business logic at the database layer. The Oracle da database world, the DB2 world, and the SQL Server world, they have a lot of business logic put into the level. So you change a column from 17 to 32, and you go back to it, and it's suddenly 19. Change it again, it goes back to 19. Then you figure out, oh, there's someone running a trigger or a stored procedure on this to do some sort of calculation and give the final value. So what I'm putting in there is not the final value. Well, I mean, it's the main, the basic way you can track the data is to change it back to the original value and then you can look at the trigger. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, triggers, when you change a column, uh, either before you make the change or after you make the change, will do some sort of function. And that function can either rewrite the column that it's playing with or write information to another column. Very valuable. With MySQL 5.7, you can stack them so you can have multiple triggers per table. I used to use them heavily in a couple applications I had because they were great. We also now have generated columns so that if you know the sales price is this amount, the VAT is going to be this amount, you can cal uh, calculate that automatically on the fly without having to do the trigger or the uh, or expense of your application. So triggers are wonderful if you like using them. Uh, if not, well, document them very well because the next guy behind you may have no idea there's a trigger. Yes, sir. Well, the, the, the query I was showing earlier, we want a city name. So it grabs the first record and says, oh, I'm supposed to chain this to the country table. And in this case, I'm supposed to find, I know that the country code for the city name is here. I go over to this other table using that as the index into the table and then pull back the name of the country. So it is not the name of the country, it's the index of the country. Yeah, but it can be the same table. So a self-join is, is valid. If you're really looking for a good book on that, there's a gentleman named C.J. Date that has a wonderful book that goes probably too deep of a level for most of us, but explains exactly the mathematics behind it, which if you're not a math fan, you can skip over it, and it talks about the mechanics behind it. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're interested, we're doing great at Oracle since the seven years since Oracle's been taking over MySQL. We've, been we've gone up five times in staffing. We're still hiring. So if you know anyone who wants to work from home or work with databases, we're looking for folks. We're making money for Uncle Larry. Uh, we're the number five class overall at Oracle. Oracle has like 10,000 products, so to be number five in the education products is pretty amazing. And we just released MySQL 8 for, for testing. So if you want to be on the bleeding edge, you can download it today. And uh, if there's no other questions, I'll be around for a while. I think we have to free up the room for the next group. But uh, thank you all for coming out. If you have any questions, contact me.